I'm trying to be modern today. <laughs> Hello, my friends. We have an awesome interview today with Parker Harris, the CTO and co-founder of Salesforce. We talk about hyper growth, scaling culture, M&A activity, and Parker shares a few inside secrets that you can apply today. You are not gonna wanna miss this one. But before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit that bell for notifications. You don't wanna miss out on all the amazing interviews that we have coming your way right here, right now on YouTube. Hi, Joel. Hey, Parker. <laughs> How are you, my friend? I'm well. Nice, you excited? Uh, I'm trying to be modern today. <clears throat> mm. That's the theme. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, at, at my age, sometimes it's hard to be modern. <laughs> You're not old. How's it hard? It's not that hard to be modern. You just got to be you, right? Ah, I'll be me. Don't worry. No, no, no worry about that. Oh, I love it. So are you familiar with the format of the podcast? Uh, I, I've heard one, but why don't you go through and, and just remind me. Be yeah. Helpful. This is it. We just hang out. Oh, cool. That's easy. Yeah. There's no big intro. We can edit anything we want. Jake okay. will make sure we sound cool. <laughs> and that's pretty simple. All right. So where are you calling in from today? Uh, I'm in uh, Salesforce Tower right now. In San Francisco? San Francisco. Yeah, where, where are you? We're in Florida, but I was actually just out there last week for a whole week and we, uh, I got to see the tower and it's a beautiful oh, yeah. tower. Yeah. Did you, go, did you go to the top floor? I did not, but oh, I was on. told to go to the top floor. You have to yeah. come up to the, that's, you can't come to the tower and not go to the top floor. So I know. Yeah. Next time you're here, let us know. Um, we'll, we'll take you up. Yeah. I, I heard there was like the most magnificent views up there. It's great. Yeah. It's, uh, it's such a tall building. It's kind of the view you get really from an airplane. And then because you have the curved glass walls, uh, it kind of feels like an IMAX theater to me, you know, because you can kind of stand and see. Uh, quite a panorama. We did go to the planetarium though, speaking of like IMAX style theaters. <laughs> okay. That was really cool. You guys had some really cool um, like planetarium and museums yeah. and things like that. It was a great city. And I ran the, uh, I ran the San Francisco bridge one morning. Oh, that, that's, uh, that's hard. You, you, you learn how it's not flat. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's definitely not flat. <laughs> San Francisco <laughs> itself is not flat. No, but the bridge looks flat, but if you run it, you're like up and then back down the other side. It was, it was pretty freaky for me. It was pretty scary. So I'm out at my hotel and it's uh, in the city area and I see the bridge in the distance and I'm like, okay, well, it's like 5 a.m. I go for runs early. And I was like, you know what? I bet you I can just go down to the water and see it a little bit better. And so I go down, I go down to like observation area and I can see it. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. I'm like, I wonder how long to get to it. Probably like 45 minute run. I've already been on a run for 30 minutes. I was like, I'll see if I can go to it. I could always Uber back. And then I get to it and then I'm like, all right, well now I'm here. I got to run over it. <laughs> nice. But while going over it, the, when there's like these guard rails that are extra high, but then when you get to the center, it's mm -hmm. only like a three foot guard rail and you can hear yeah. the water and it gets very, uh, very nerve wracking. Well, that, that's to allow the jumpers to jump. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I told, I told Allison on the trip, I was like, yeah, there's so many jumpers jump. They just ended up painting it red. She goes, is that why it's red? <laughs> <laughs> like, I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea. All yeah. right. But so I'm, sp I'm particularly excited to be talking to you today. Wonderful. And that's because there's this book that I based my entire company on. And I started it last year and we've grown to 11 people and it's doing great. And it was this book called Predictable Revenue. You know the book? I don't know the book. You don't know the book? Sorry. <laughs> Come on. Shit. Okay. So it's about basically. <laughs> Who wrote this book? Uh, Aaron Ross. Okay. And it's basically about um, how they scaled sales at Salesforce. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, yeah, it was, you know, what was interesting is when we started Salesforce, Mark was very clear even before I met him and, and the, you know, little three page treatise he had written on the idea, the recurring revenue model was really the most important thing to him, uh, that, you know, we, we retain. 
And it was really interesting as we got investors, uh, you know, we actually did try to get uh, some venture capital firms to invest and they said no at the time. Uh, I think it was actually a good thing because um, we had a lot of revenue, but we weren't recognizing all of it up front, right? It's a recurring revenue stream. And we weren't public. Uh, now, if you're a venture capital firm, what you're gonna want is you're gonna wanna show a giant revenue stream and go public and have a big, you know, big payout and, and then, you know, and then move on to your next IPO. And so, but we didn't have the pressure of those, you know, those types of investors. We had investors that appreciated our goal of this flywheel of recurring revenue that, you know, when we started, it, you know, it takes a while to build it up to, you know, to get the cash flow positive, to get the profitability took a while and you had to have patience. Uh, but that patience paid off because yes, you know, we're basically earning the revenue this year that will show up next year. And, you know, we already know roughly what our earnings, you know, and our revenue will be this year. So it's very, very, very predictable and allows us to make adjustments much more easily, um, you know, to, to adjust as, as we see changes in the market, changes in our product lines that we need to account for. That's exciting. So it's, you just had your 20 year anniversary, right? We did. So is it greater than you imagined back in, back in the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone always asks me that question. And, you know, it, it's kind of like the frog in boiling water. You know, each year uh, this gets bigger. Uh, it gets more amazing. And no, you know, when we started the company, we definitely thought about uh, what we could create in terms of a, of a technology and a product and that it was not something just for small businesses. It was something that was, would serve, uh, hopefully one day, all corporations of any size globally, wherever they, they might be. Uh, but, you know, we are a very tactics dictate strategy company. That's been our philosophy ever since we started. And I think that's part of our success is that agile iterative model. And so we don't really look, uh, even though we market and we talk about the long-term future, our execution is very near term. You know, our, our sales reps you talk about um, predictable revenue. We have a 12 quarter close every year, right? Each month is like, well, what did we do that month? What did we do the next month? You know, the revenue we earn in February, the month of February is worth 12 times what the, the revenue we'll earn next January. You know, so. Uh, it, also, it, help me with that one. Well, it's recurring revenue. So if, whatever revenue we earn in February. Oh, okay, I get what you're saying. We get to recognize yeah. 12 times that. The revenue we earn in January, we're gonna earn only one twelfth of that. Right. Got it. Because of the of the rateable revenue model. And so, you know, we're super tactical, super iterative. The only time where I really get visibility into our scale, well, lately, you know, I'm in Salesforce Tower right now. And so that's that's a physical manifestation of scale. But it's really a dream force when, you know, we have 150,000 people, you know, 15 plus million online. Uh, and the swarms of people and the impact we have on our customers, our partners, you know, the nonprofits that show up, the money we, we raise for nonprofits every year with that conference, and the people who come up to me and say, you know, Parker, you're like, thank you, you know, Salesforce changed my life. I'm like, wow, that's, you know, <laughs> that's quite something. Uh, and that's really where I, I see the visible scale of the company. Uh, but, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, we, we really feel, I feel like st many days, like an, I'm in a startup. I was just meeting with some of our top architects just now, talking about our future architecture for part of the service and feel similar, you know, in ways to Dave Frank and I in the apartment on a whiteboard. Uh, and so I think our iterative agile nature has helped us be successful because we, you know, even though we're a pretty large company now, we still move uh, very, very quickly. No, and I love it. I love that your background was writing code too. I mean, I've been writing code for 17 years, so yeah. Yeah, so, you know, you must've started when you were like three. 
No, I'm, I look young. No, <laughs> no, I started getting really, I, my dad would take me to work with him and give me little tasks so he could get work done because he was freelancing on nights and weekends. And so he had me, you know, moving stuff around and memory buffers and doing small, small tasks at age eight. And then, wow. and then at 13, I got hit by a car and I was in a wheelchair for a year. And mm. so during that time, I got to spend a lot more time at the computer and get really into programming and then yeah. all the way up through high school and now i'm 31. wow awesome yeah what not was your to, first programming language i uh, just a basic yeah yeah so i'm like i'm only two years away from when you started uh salesforce <laughs> that's true right <laughs> that is true yeah yeah, yeah except so, yeah except i had uh three little ch children i've got two <laughs> Oh, you have two. All right. Yeah. Congratulations. I look young. I promise you this. Congratulations. I look young. Yeah. I've got a 17 or 18 month old little girl. Oh, adorable. She's a little younger there. And then we yeah. have a uh, three week old little boy. Wow. Congratulations. Oh. Yeah, you got your hands full. <laughs> My wife has her hands full. Yeah. <laughs> here's yeah. here's a picture this morning. You got uh, one sitting on the carpet and then he's in the little rock and play thing. Nice. Well, you got someone to help you there taking care of you. Yes. Little. <laughs> I, I love when they run up to me, like Aria, uh, Aria and Lachlan. So uh, she'll run up to me uh, after I get home from work and I'm like, this is the best feeling on the planet. <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's nothing better. So how old are your kids? I'm about to be an empty nester. So yeah. uh, my kids are very close in age to Salesforce. My daughter is 21, uh, junior mm -hmm. in college, and I have twin 18 year old boys that are about to go to college. Oh, nice. Yeah. So when we started Salesforce, I had a one and a half year old and then a year in, I had three under three. So it was, <sighs> it was good times. <laughs> it um, teaches you discipline, persistence. It teaches you a whole lot of great human things. <laughs> yeah. Well, it teaches you the importance of balance, you know, and uh, clearly Salesforce is super part of, super important part of my life. Uh, but also my family is also a key part of my life and making sure that you don't have one, um, you know, take too much of from the other. So speaking of kids, let's go back to when Parker was really young, right? What was your earliest memory of technology? Like when did you no. experience it? Yeah. So in the early eighties, probably. So I was in eighth grade. So yeah, so that would have been the early 80s. I don't think it was late 70s. So early 80s in eighth grade, um, my grandfather actually gave me the money to buy an Apple II computer. And my school had uh, two Apple II uh, computers. Uh, they had started with um, cassette tapes for storage. So, you know, uh, we'd push record on the <laughs> cassette tape recorder yeah. and press hit, hit save and it would write to the cassette tape and and that was that was an early I guess that was the first uh, phase of video games you know pong and you know was er, actually that was before that but then like things like early video games is what inspired me like wow those are so cool and I wonder how they work and um, and so I got this Apple II and uh, subscribed to Nibble magazine which uh, I don't know if you've heard of that magazine but I got uh, a nibble apparently is half a bite. Uh, I only know that mm -hmm. because I subscribe to the to the magazine, and there was a lot of sample code in there. And you know, one year my sister and I typed in a program that I got out of the magazine for um, creating a banner on a, on a from a, um, a printer. You know, so you could say like "Merry Christmas," and mm -hmm. you know, it took the ASCII characters and blew them up um, into into the large banner. And so I just remember, you know, I wrote little programs. I wrote a program to kind of be, instead of a command line interface, it was, you know, a, more a menu system for uh, operating the computer. I, you know, early user of CompuServe and uh, had a copy of Locksmith, you know, not that I did anything illegal, but you know, I might have made a few copies of some software that I needed to use for personal use. Um, so, yeah, I just, I loved the plasticity of computing that I could take ideas and then, you know, 
and then make them happen on the screen and then the computer make the computer do things and you know and the satisfaction of you know working through hard problems when the bugs happen and just just love i just fell in love with computing and that was kind of my my entry you know a little later than you but my entry into uh, the love of computers and software oh, i love it uh do you know steve case uh i, I have not met him but i certainly know of him yeah he when when i was thinking about salesforce sending out like you know all your competitors are sending out cds right and then I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about you know, AOL was sending out a lot of CDs. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Were you just like sick of seeing CDs at the supermarket, <laughs> and, you, and you were just like, "Hey, let's do let's do no CDs." Yeah. Uh, well, actually, it's funny you say that. Our big launch party that we had in 1999, February 1999, pouring down rain. At a, a, previously, it was a movie theater, but they had re redone it called the, the Regis. Um, theater on Van Ness here in San Francisco. We did this big launch party and we had at the bottom of uh, the, the building, you'd enter, it was a stark white lighting and we, and we paid actors to, they were in jail and they were trying to like hand you CDs as you walk in, like, hey, wouldn't you like some software? So we had lots of early stunts. We paid actors to protest a Siebel conference early on and, you know, and, and basically say you know say no to software software is bad and we had a fake news crew <laughs> that was filming them saying tell us what you think about software and some of the attendees actually came in and like started talking to the reporter and it was hilarious so yeah you know our early vision uh, when i met mark you know i had been doing early cloud as a consultant with uh, my co-founders dave molinoff and frank dominguez and uh and so we were already in that space and could see the possibilities. And prior to that, we had done Salesforce automation at a company called Metropolis Software. So we had the background in SFA. We had early cloud. And Mark you know, had, this, uh, had this business plan saying, I want to do enterprise software that you know, is easy as, as buying a book on Amazon.com, except I want to do it in the Salesforce automation space. Like, well, you know, I'm, I personally met Mark in 98 uh, through a consulting job, had lunch with him and said, this is a fantastic idea and, and you've met the right team uh, because not only do we have a clear background in Salesforce automation, but we've done a, a, a lot of work in bringing a number of um, enterprises to the cloud. Uh, we had done some work for a company on the peninsula that was doing a learning system. Another one was doing debt arbitrage prior to the crash uh, <laughs> that they were moving to the cloud. And, and I could totally see the possibility. First, the three of us could envision very easily the Salesforce automation system, but we also saw the potential. And you know, as a technologist, so this is about you know, a, a technologist's view of the world, the satisfaction of knowing that I actually will be running the system and can see what's wrong and can actually jump in and fix it for my customer as opposed to the customer calls up and say, hey, it's not working. And then you go through that really frustrating conversation. Well, what's not working and where is it not working? And well, what are you running it on? And you know, what's your connection to the internet? On and on and on. Instead, we had the power to deliver customer success to our customers and I could say, well, we're going to take our first CTO, Dave Molinoff, my co-founder. Dave, go look at this problem. The customer is having a problem, no matter what size. And you just couldn't do that when you ship software. I couldn't ship Dave to every single customer and say, put him on a plane, go look at their implementation, figure out what's wrong. And so it's not that you know, engineers were doing bad things or doing the wrong thing before. It's just the model is flawed uh, to deliver great a great service, and and so we saw that day one when when we met Mark, we thought about this idea. And we thought, well, yeah, we can nail this. I love it. So you guys, you got really big, right? And a lot of great leaders have come out of Salesforce. So specifically, I happen to know Andy Sin. Um, he's the CTO and co-founder of AppDirect. Mm -hmm. He. We were talking, and they're a pretty big company too. 
But when we were, um, he ran a lot of the app exchange for Salesforce um, and in engineering yeah. uh, in like 2006, 2008. Mm -hmm. But when we were talking, he was crediting so much of his success and agile and learning and project and engineering to his time at Salesforce, which makes me think that uh, you guys turn out quite a few high quality leaders. Well, first of all, we, we try not to lose any of our high quality leaders. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> and and we actually have a lot of boomerangs, as we call them, that uh, have left and come back. So, you know, we we definitely prioritize our people first, and making them successful is is job one. Um, yeah, it's not without trial and error. Certainly, you know, we have our share of of agility issues of you know large companies and lots of acquisitions. Uh, which is which is actually why I, I shifted more to the CTO role in architecture. Um, but yeah, over the years, you know, we as as I said early in the call, iteration and tactics are super important, and constant improvement super important. So uh, early on, uh, we were not uh, thinking about agile computing and you know agile methodologies. Uh, when you're five people in an apartment, you're naturally agile. <laughs> when you're you know, we went public and I, you know, we were teeny as an engineering team. We were under 50 people when we went public, you know, in, of all of engineering. So uh, we were very agile. But then as we grew, uh, the natural evolution was, well, you know, it's this waterfall process. And we had this kind of come to Jesus moment where uh, instead of shipping code, you know, every week, every four weeks, you know, every month. Uh, every several months, you know, it kept getting longer to one point where we didn't ship code for a year and we had a crisis. And that was when uh, we had some advisors, uh, Maynard Webb, who's a, one of our board members, was uh, an advisor and, and Lynn Reedy, who worked with him at eBay, Adam Bosworth, who's a luminary in the industry now, I think at AWS. Uh, we had these incredible people and they said, oh, well, this is what you should do. eBay does this train model. It's massive branching and massive integration with a lot of automation. I was like, yeah, awesome. Train model, sign me up. Uh, so I wrote a <laughs> document. I called it Shinkansen, you know, the Japanese bullet train, train model. And uh, my <laughs> engineering team threw up all over it. They're like, nope, that's not going to happen here. It won't work. Great idea, but our use case and you know and what we're doing just it's not going to work. We can't have everyone creating separate branches and massive integration. It's going to be a debacle. And that's when uh, I said, okay, well, let's come up with another idea. And um, and two great leaders um, uh, came to me and said, all right, well, you know this this thing called agile, you know, and it's more about iteration. And you know, we were. Waterfall. So of course we blamed QE, uh, who's at the end of the line. It's their fault <laughs> that we're late, you know, of course, because of course. you know they're the ones the, the last step. Um, and uh, and so uh, instead we said, all right, fine, let's go agile. And they wanted to roll it out um, more incrementally, you know. And we were probably 150 people by then in engineering, uh, so bigger but not huge. Uh, and they said, we don't want to break things, you know, so we're just going to roll out a few teams. And I said, nope, uh, we have a crisis here. And, uh, and I said, we're rolling it out everywhere all at once. And, you know, in the spirit of Agile, we're going to time box the next release. We're going to say, we're going to release whatever the date was. Uh, and that's, that's a requirement is that date and quality is the other requirement. And I don't care if we ship nothing, you know, we could have zero new features, but we are going to move to this agile model. We're going to move to this fixed date. I had a lot of people getting upset, product manager, like, wait, you can't do that because I can't get my thing out. Um, but it, it was a crisis. And so, yeah, we weren't perfect. We learned through the years, um, but we moved to agile and it was, it was a miracle. You know, it like everything changed from that point. Uh, and, you know, I, I also credit my head of engineering, Srini Talapragada, who we hired uh, later, 
who has just taken uh, you know all of our practices and you know talk about operational ex uh, excellence. You know, I hand I hand to him the job of running all of engineering, and he just whips everything into shape. You know, the trains go out on time, so we we do uh, three major releases a year at incredible scale. And you think about like you know with no regressions in our customers' code, uh, with you know very few bugs, um, with very few performance regressions. You think about you know all the things you have to checkpoint. Um, you know, we're still shipping software, except, we're, you know, we're just shipping it to our own data centers. And we take the upgrade process on for our customers because our customers are living above that in a metadata layer where they're telling us how they want the system to run, the data model, the logic, the user experience. Um, and, but underneath, we're changing out the engine three times a year. And, and that's, you know, major surgery. Uh, and so the amount of expertise we have uh, is pretty incredible. And that's why people who do leave, um, which there are very few, and anyone who's <laughs> listening to this, if you left Salesforce, Andy. Have, well, you are welcome back anytime. Uh, we, we love to bring you back. Uh, but that's why they leave with such incredible expertise. Hey, you guys aren't doing like things that are incredibly easy. You're doing... You're like Elon Musk, right? Staring into the abyss and eating glass. Like it's difficult, unfamiliar stuff, but it sounds like you've gotten really good at it. Well, thank you. Yeah, we, we, we've gotten really good, but we still have, you know, a lot more to go. You know, I think right now where the world is going is, um, you know, more and more to the public cloud uh, providers, more and more to microservices, uh, more and more to DevOps and service ownership. You know, we just had an architecture summit of our, my top 500 architects mm -hmm. and you know that was a lot of the conversation is you know how do we keep moving the ball forward uh, you know when I acquire a little teeny company that built something on the AWS um, you know small group small code base but really interesting people and great technology and great uh, products they want that experience uh, you know at Salesforce and yet I have to take that experience and give it uh, all the attributes of the Salesforce brand, uh, which is around Salesforce security, Salesforce compliance, Salesforce performance, Salesforce you know, uh, quality. And, uh, and so we have to up-level all these companies as they come in. Uh, and yet I need to do that and still provide the agility and the amazing capabilities that they had as, you know, before they came into the company. So you mentioned something about earlier about acquisitions and you moving to CTO role. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like what sure. caused you to say, Hey, I need to make this change. Well, a couple of things. So, uh, over a period of 20 years, we've done 60 acquisitions. And so, you know, of all sizes. Um, so some of those might've been small tuck ins as we call them. Uh, and some of them might have been major acquisitions like MuleSoft, uh, which is a company we acquired yeah, for a API management or integration. We acquired them last year, uh, our biggest acquisition to date. Um, and, and so that's awesome. You know, we would not be the company we are without having uh, gotten really good at acquisitions and done really every one of those uh, 60 acquisitions. Um, but as, I, as you acquire those acquisitions, they come with their own data stores and their own compute layers and their own code bases and their own uh, you know, development methodology. And so, uh, and yet, you know, if, you, if you look at our marketing as a company, we, we talk about the customer success platform and sales and service and marketing and commerce and uh, you know, quip for uh, collaboration. And all the aspects of you know customer interfaces and the customer 360 and AI, all of that working seamlessly together. Underneath, you know, we've done a number of acquisitions. And so what I recognized is, wow, you know, we're running our technology in you know 70 to 80 different data centers. If you include public cloud um, regions, uh, so that's a lot of different uh, you know places. We have uh, you know, a number of different database technologies, a number of different messaging technologies. And what I want is uh, 
to deliver to our customers and continue to improve the technology we have to deliver that customer success platform, that customer 360. And so two years ago, I, I shifted uh, more towards uh, you know, a CTO architecture driven role where I as a co-founder can, uh, you know, through uh, really a lot of influence, work across all of our product lines. You know, I have Srini Talapragada who's running our engineering and so great. Let's make sure that we're still gonna remain number one in Salesforce automation, number one in, in service, number one in marketing. But then what I did is I said, that's great, but across, when you go from sales and service, you know, everything's more and more cross channel now. Or if you're going from commerce to service or commerce to marketing, I want the experience for our customers to be seamless. And I don't want them to have to uh, do extra work to make that solution work well. And so what I did is, is I moved to focusing on architecture and driving more long range planning. So our success is still on tactics, uh, but long range planning is important if you wanna, you know, it takes years sometimes to really move the needle on some of this. And, uh, and so I started focusing on that and, and getting teams across these different units working together and collaborating and you know, getting engineers you know, who really want to ship code and work on their thing to pick their heads up and say, oh, okay, wow, that team over there is doing something fairly similar. How do we start to collaborate? How could we move more to a more shared service model? And, uh, and so we have a number of long range plans of a lot of different disciplines, you know, from metadata to persistence to messaging, uh, and on and on and on, security. And it's really aligned a lot of the teams, a lot of the architects, and has given us kind of a North Star of where we wanna go, that then when we go back to tactics, which is how we operate, it guides that direction. I love it. Like, I'm, so, so when, when we're talking about this, you're talking, like, it'd be like you sort of standardizing how messaging is done at Salesforce across your teams? Is that what you're, talking about well so so that's an example i just okay. met I, I just met with the team that uh so we created uh in our core product or our sales and service and, and lightning offering something called platform events so if you think about message-based architectures or kind of asynchronous more message-based architectures are definitely a, a better way to scale uh some types of workloads so uh we have a team that built something uh with for some of our clouds for sales and service and our you know, lightning platform. But other clouds like marketing and commerce uh, also really need to consume that same bus because you may wanna have an event that needs to be shared between those clouds. So what they're talking about in a long range plan is how does this service start to level up and be a global service and think about it as, as a messaging service for everyone that everyone can standardize on that, you know, allows metadata defined messages to be uh, consumed regardless of, you know, what data center and what product you're working on that, you know, it's, it's a unifying layer that's really important for part of our future architecture. It's interesting. So the new acquisitions could actually just adapt to that layer. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Probably get that uh, worked into the acquisition with your amazing acquisition team. <laughs> <laughs> there's definitely a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of art to uh, integrating acquisitions, you know, and it's not just technical, it's definitely a major cultural aspect and, and a people aspect, you know, and giving, giving that acquired team a vision of how, you know, they're bigger and better as part of us. And I think we've gotten quite good at it. Mark really prioritized the focus on doing acquisitions early on. And even more than me, because I like to make things work, that's my job, is he's okay if a small acquisition early on failed. Uh, I would be really upset, like, oh, gosh, that, you know, that wasted some money or it wasted some time. But his point was always, well, we need to get good at acquisitions. And it's important that we're not afraid to do them. And I think that's why we've done, you know, 60 acquisitions, why 
you know, when we do a big one like MuleSoft, it's why, you know, we're able to really make it successful. Let's run a hypothetical. We'll have fun. Okay. I like to have fun. Okay. Uh, let's say that I'm going to do my first acquisition of another technology company and we have similar customer base. And so I want to acquire them and pull them in. Uh, and let's talk about the human side of things. So we don't get too technical on the, on the business side of the hypothetical human side of things. What should I look for? What advice is like after doing all these acquisitions, you're, you have like a top three hit list, I'm sure of where you're going to start probing. Um, give me some advice. It's like, I'm going to do my first acquisition. Where should I focus some of my energy? Well, I think first you need to try to uh, understand their culture. Uh, you know, is it, is it a command and control type of culture where it's very hierarchical? Is it a really flat, super collaborative culture? Uh, is it a culture where teams fully own uh, their areas? You know, you talk about autonomy and mastery, or is it a, or is it a kind of company that is more matrixed? And then hopefully you understand what your culture is like. And uh, and, you, and you can do that by, you know, just talking to leaders and understanding their personalities, ask them about their leadership style, ask them about their org structure and, and how, and basically how they think about building and growing their own company. And then try to, try to figure out, are you similar or are you really different? And that doesn't mean you should do the acquisition or not. It's, you know, it's not a disqualifier if the culture is different. But I would say if the culture is similar, that's, that bodes really well uh, for your success. Uh, and it's not that one culture is better than another. It's just that, you know, people are different. Co you know, companies are different depending on, you know, really the founders and how they, they crafted the original organization and vision. Um, if it is different, then you should definitely think about, well, how are we going to integrate them and, and are, you know, how much are we going to try to change them? Um, you know, it's kind of like a bad relationship. You say, well, this person is really different than me and, you know, but I can fix them. Usually that doesn't <laughs> work out so well. Ask uh, my last you know. few girlfriends. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's, you know, from a cultural perspective is super important. And, and we've grown over time to understand that uh, it, as important. Um, definitely look at uh, security. Uh, we will disqualify companies, you know, because trust is still our number one value, always has been. And so, you know, Technically, how, how are they dealing with cybersecurity? Um, how do they talk about it and think about it as a priority? And, uh, you know, we always have to up-level companies uh, when we bring them in, but how much of a problem is that going to be? And sometimes it can be such a problem that it, it's deep in the architecture and it means that it's going to be very expensive to go fix. Um, you know, at Salesforce, our, you know, trust is number one. Then customer success, our second value. Well, you know, how does that, the company you're looking at, think about customer success? How do they think about serving their customers? Are they, are they selling futures and hoping that eventually they will deliver and, you know, customers uh, are frustrated? Or are they really focused on making their customers successful and listening? And it's not that you know, you don't have customer issues. It's how do you deal with them when you do have a customer issue? You know, early on, you know, as we were growing, you know, you get a two person company, three person company complain to us in an email and Mark would say, we'll get right on it. And we would put our top people on it. And, you know, if, if you look at that as a, as a size issue or a money issue that, you know, what they're paying us versus what we're putting on it, we're not making money on that account. It's totally the wrong way to think. It's, you know, make every single customer successful and they will help you grow your company. They'll, they will become the trailblazers is what we call, uh, call them now um, because they'll spread word of mouth. They'll talk about your company and they'll frankly help you sell. sell. Uh, and, yeah, and you, have a, you have a, is it a trailblazers event or you have some sort of a trailhead? That's the software yeah. development conference coming up yeah it's coming up uh trailhead dx is coming up in may so i, I hope it you sounds cool here. it's our developer conference and uh 
it's grown every year. I think we're, I think it's growing to about 14 or 15,000 people this year. Wow. And, uh, you know, it's all types of developers. It's admins, it's hardcore programmers. And they're gonna, it's going to be here in San Francisco at Moscone uh, Conference Center. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of like a mini dream for us, but just for the geeks. Dude, I'm in. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. I, I love that type of stuff. And you, you have all the tracks posted on the... Yeah, yeah. Just... Re- registration's open. So okay. let, me, let me know if you can make it out. I'd love to host you here, Joel. Oh yeah, that would be, I love, I'm loving San Francisco even more. You know, it's hard to be in the technology business and not be out in San Francisco. Yeah. Like, plus, I, go, I go out there a lot. <laughs> plus, it, plus it starts to get a little hot in Florida around then. So you might want right? to cool off here in San Francisco. Yeah. The first time I, I went, it was in the summer. And so I leave here, it's 90 and humid and I get to San Francisco and I'm like, it's like 60 degrees. I'm like, what is going on? And people explain to me the effect in the city and yeah. the water. And I was like, well, it's very nice. <laughs> very much enjoy it. Exactly. So how many people total in technology at Salesforce? I don't think we rev- we published that number. Oh, so. okay. Because you said 500 architects. So I mean, like, let's say it's over yeah. a thousand people in technology. Jake, Jake, do we give that number? Jake on. I don't know. Uh, not usually that full number. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so you have a lot of people in technology. <laughs> we have thousands and thousands of people. In okay. Technology. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So with working with all these people, like uh, this. Uh, sorry, was he talking still? Go ahead. Oh, okay. So that was just my intro to a question about stress. <laughs> you got lots of people, lots of moving parts. How do you personally deal with stress? Hmm. Yeah, well, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, as I said, our people are most important and, uh, and we have, um, in our planning process, which we we should probably talk about, uh, our first priority is actually people and, and, and their well-being. And so what I've always done is, you know, obviously, food and sleep it's the basics like make sure you're eating right make sure you're sleeping i get exercise uh but then and exercise certainly helps with stress but you know we've had some super stressful times uh, and i usually try at some point it's not you have to let yourself you have to give yourself permission to be less stressed is what i would say Ooh. and you can do that by stepping back and trying to get a little perspective on the situation uh and frankly i also use humor i think humor is a great uh stress reliever that uh and some people find it a little dark but in the most stressful situations when things are really uh really tough i usually will will make a joke out of it you know and and, and just laugh about it um and and that makes me feel better and usually helps others kind of get a little relief no, I love it. And I like that you talked about the basics too, because they're always the most boring and everybody knows them, but they're the hardest to do Yeah, consistently. And so, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I always tell people, look, we are not running a sprint here. You know, we just had our 20th birthday. We are running a marathon. You know, as you said, you're, you're a runner. You were here in San Francisco and he's like, I'm going to keep going. We keep going across the Golden Gate Bridge. Well, I want all of our engineers to keep going. And so, you know, if, if we're overstressed in the short term and we feel like this one thing is the most important thing in life and nothing's more important, then how are you gonna get to that next one if you become so stressed that you get burned out, that you need to take a break? And sometimes that happens and that's okay. And you know, that's another way to relieve stress is like, okay, you really need to take a break. So I'll, we'll say, you know, we'll tell people to take a break. Uh, one, one of our top engineers uh, at a previous company, we tried to hire him early on. His name was Craig Weissman. Uh, he was our second CTO. And uh, we brought him into the office. He was, uh, and he was really stressed out. Uh, and we, we were trying to hire him. And we said, all right, Mark, we want you to talk to Craig and we want you to close him. It's really important. So Craig goes into Mark's office. And they're talking, they're talking, we're waiting for him to come out. And we're like really excited. Like, Mark, 
is a, Mark is a consummate closer. He's going to close him. <laughs> Craig comes out and he says, well, Mark told me I need to go to Spain for a month and I need to spend a lot of money on a great house that, you know, I could live in and that I just need to go relax. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to come here and help us build Salesforce. What happened? And, uh, and Mark just read him and said, you know, you're too stressed, you know, you need to leave and, and go take care of yourself. And he did. And then he came back and, uh, you know, he's the father of Apex Co, the father of Visual Force. You know, he, he brought some of our coolest and most successful te technological uh, advances. Um, and it was worth waiting. Uh, and so, you know, your well-being and, and your ability to deal with stress is super important. And I think, you know, we're never perfect, but we, we focus a lot on it. You know what I like about that story? It tells me a lot about like how, you know, I don't know a lot about the Salesforce culture. I've been learning about it on the call here with you, but it, it tells me a lot about like how it aligns with our culture because what he did was, is he did what was right for the person and not what was necessarily in his best immediate interest but he instead looked at it as what is right for this human right now and then did that thing. And yeah. I love that. Yeah, it's kind of, it kind of relates to the success metric that we have and value. Uh, and it's not just about our customers, it's about, we use the word Ohana, which is a Hawaiian yeah. term for family, you know, and our employees, our partners, our customers, you know, our vendors, it's all part of our Ohana. And, uh, and we do a lot to, you know, really take care of them. Super important. Yeah, I'm getting this new perspective on business. So prior, all of my technology and business experience was just building applications and platforms for either VCs or just customers uh, that came through from relationships from VC type people. And so I didn't have like corporate company customers, right? I just did these like projects and that was cool. But now at this company, we have corporate co like customers and things like that. And it's so different than I imagined. Parker, it is so incredible like, you get to know these people. Like yeah. they're in the same boat with you. You have to figure it out together. Like our success is intrinsically tied together. And then it, be, it makes it, when you have that relationship and you get to experience that and you realize that, wow, I'm just kind of like doing business with friends, my customers, like everybody just kind of comes together and it's like, this is who you do life with. This is who you have to spend time with. You'll have ups and downs with these people and they're your customers and you're, you know, you're providing some value to them. So the, it's so different than I guess my imagination uh, had set up. But the coolest thing about all of it is like, as you start getting them and growing them, you can refer people to them like in our sales stuff. We can say, Oh, if you're undecided, you know, just talk to one of our customers. And then we yeah. just, they're like super excited about it. And they're like, Oh, you won't believe like this works for us. And, and I was like, what? Like that is by far the most useful thing in the world. And so I know it's like, I feel like a child learning to walk. Like I'm all excited about something that you're, you've lived in and, and breathed yeah. for the past 20 years. But I'll tell you what, like it is much cooler than I thought it would be. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about those relationships. Exactly. And, yeah. uh, and, you know, back to our su customer success value, making the customer successful. And, you know, this is technology we're talking about. So you can abuse it, you can mess it up, you can have a bad implementation. And, but when that happens, it's not about being perfect. It's about what do you do when there is a problem and how do you show up and, you know, are you going to show up and jump on it and help them and be their trusted partner? Or are you going to wait for them to really scream about it and, you know, try to hide behind things? And, you know, I, I think when I ship software, sometimes you wanted to do that because you were worried you couldn't solve the problem. Um, but in cloud computing, I think we're all empowered to make our customers successful. And it just pays back in riches, like you said, like, you know, it's almost even better if you've been through a hard hardship with a customer and you work through it in the trenches with them, you know, they will work with you for life, you know, they, cause they've seen you in, in the heat of battle, working through a problem, being there for them. And, and then they trust you. And, and yes. we've had CIOs who I've, I've known for many, many years and, 
you know, sometimes they change companies and when they change companies, they still have this relationship and, you know, and then they say, Hey, we need to bring Salesforce in. So obviously selfishly it helps us. Yeah, no, this is exactly the customer I had in my mind. He had an issue. We onboarded them. It was two or three weeks into it. He noticed something funky, he called us up. It was for EST time. It was Friday at like four fifty, And he's like, Hey, what's going on here? And we're like, well, that's interesting. Let's take a look at it. We started digging through some logs. And then I was like, this is like unacceptable. We have to handle this right now. And I realized like by the time it hit seven o'clock that no one in my team had even flinched. We were all sitting here like huddled around the screen. Like we have to get this right for this person. We just signed them. They're liking the platform. And I was cringing inside like, oh my gosh, we're going to lose this customer. Like, I can't believe we've deployed 20 customers. We haven't had an issue. And then our biggest client yet has an issue. And uh, it just killed me inside. But we stayed up uh, all night, worked on it. The next day, Saturday, I was emailing him, you know, every three or four hours with an update. This is what we found. You know, it's like not, not a threat. We've reduced it to this. We ultimately found out the issue it was a QA engineer did something. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, it was a Q QA engineer had done something that we classified as a security event because we didn't know how it got there. Um, and so they were just testing something in production to replicate it that they had seen in staging. And we're like, we thought it was a security breach, but it wasn't. So we were like, just keep it, like we were freaking out. Um, but it was uh, ultimately the, the way he felt about us after that, we went out and visited him when I was in San Francisco last week. And he was like, you know, what you guys did, like, he goes, I, I, it's just unbelievable how you just dropped everything. And I was like, oh, I think we got a fan for life. Yeah, yeah. so important. But for me, there was no other, there's no other possibility. There's, it's my brand. It's the business. It's like no customer should ever have anything but a perfect experience. That's what we shoot for. And right. um, it, it just, it's amazing how like it attaches to you and it's like, you can't let this happen. You know? Yeah. And so my advice to you, you know, if you think about your company, you said you had what, 10 people? Yeah. 11. Yeah. 11 people. Mm -hmm. So it's easy for those 11 people to understand your culture and understand that value. But you know, that's why it's been important for us to write our values down, to talk about them. You know, when we have events and we market to our customers and our partners, we want our employees to go to those events because we're also teaching our employees about what we value and what's important. And so think about, you know, if you were going to go from 11 to, you know, 10,000 people, which would be pretty cool. How do you then make sure they all share your values, what you just said? And so making sure you write it down, making sure you're communicating transparently as a company, uh, reviewing it openly and transparently regularly. And, you know, how do you onboard your employees to teach them not just about your technology and your mission as a company, but your values is super, super important. I'm taking notes, Parker. <laughs> And then I'll develop lots of relationships with people, great people like you to help keep me uh, on, the right, on the right track. But yeah, we have uh, dreams of complete and total domination of the industry. Simply, simply because if we're, that's like by us doing our best work, that's the natural byproduct. Yeah, exactly. Right. Oh man, this is, this is great. So I will definitely, I'm definitely interested in coming out in May. I think it'd be really cool to meet you and experience this culture. I've seen so many write-ups on the culture and style of the events. And so I think yeah. it's, I think it's really cool to see how it translated for the engineering. Have you been to a Salesforce event? No, I haven't. Oh, well, you're, you're in, you know, if you don't make it out for Trailhead DX, you should definitely make it for Dreamforce or both. Dreamforce is next year. I don't remember when. It's probably September or November. I think it's November next year. Yeah, it's just before Thanksgiving. So, um, but the tales, the legend. I know the legend because it like shuts down the city. It's like the biggest yeah. thing ever. Yeah. yeah, and and you just get to talk to so many customers. I mean, you would meet and you would develop business too. A lot of a lot of customers come to talk to other customers that we have, and and they're selling. You know, they're, they're building their business. They're building their relationships. Uh, it's, it's just a great time. Yeah. I first learned about it through listening to a YouTube recording of Tony Robbins. He was giving like a speech there at the event and he was talking about it and talking about uh, the culture and the company and everything. And so through one of his 
pieces of audio content, I ended up like learning about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one last question as we wrap up. Um, so I noticed when I was reading, I read some of the Business Insider articles with you and they had, um, and I felt like we connected on this. So they had this picture of you. You looked magnetic, intelligent. You were speaking publicly. And it, and it said, uh, Parker Harris is not shy. <laughs> he is an excellent public speaker. And so I was like, okay, okay. So I started out shy and quiet. But then I sort of, I see it as like we often typecast engineers into that because that's sort of a state you have to be in to think super deeply for extended periods of time. Like you can't be really loud thinking deeply and quietly for extended periods of time. So I see it more as like a, like a caterpillar butterfly thing where it's like a stage in your existence moving from quiet introvert engineer to, you know, outgoing, dynamic, confident individual. But I also was, was reading in the article and you had a great amount of confidence for the quality of your work early on, or at least in your thirties. Right. And you said you were the, were the best in the Valley. And so that's, that's very attractive to me. Right. <laughs> um, but were you always uh, very confident and, and well-spoken or did you, were you quiet and shy at first? So I, I'm, I lean more towards a, an introvert. Um, uh, but I've, I've learned to speak, uh, you know, when our first conference ever was, I think it was all things digital, pretty sure it was Palm Springs. And, uh, the, I mean, this was in 1999. So, you know, we barely had the service at the time <laughs> and we had bugs in the service. It was crashing every hour because we had a memory leak that we couldn't find. And, but you know, we, we had to be in the show. Mark was on stage and he wanted me to do the demo. And so I'm like, sure, I'll do the demo. You know, I'll be the quiet guy at the computer, you know, do the demo. So Mark gets up and, you know, we had a guy in the audience restarting the server, you know, right when we got up to make sure we didn't have the, the memory leak. And, uh, and Mark starts talking and I'm like, okay, I'm ready to do the demo. And then he turns to me, he's like, Parker, would you like to say anything? And I'm like, uh, hello palm springs <laughs> that's all i could come up with you know because i was like just tongue-tied um but you know at salesforce public speaking is really important and uh, so as i said we had an architecture summit last week and we had our architects presenting and we had speaking coaches that worked with with them uh you know because we want them to learn to speak now a lot of them are geeks they're introverts they don't want to speak but you should have seen it they were amazing um, and at our Dreamforce events we're always rotating new speakers in because we want everyone to get up there and uh, and have that experience is also incredible to you know stand up in front of that many people um, we have world we take Dreamforce on the road uh, so it comes probably I don't know if we do one in Florida, but we do one very, you know, we do one in Atlanta. We do one in oh, I'm New going York. to the mothership, my friend. Oh, come like, to the mothership. I, I've got, if I've, if I'm sold on the experience and all these dreams of what I heard it is, like I have to have the actual experience. Yeah. So, um, so just a long, long answer. No, I, I was not comfortable public speaking. Uh, you know, my first uh, event, official Salesforce event was in Sydney that I, that I hosted myself and led. Uh, and it's now on the bloopers reel uh, that marketing has <laughs> because, you know, I, I was going through and doing a great job and then I just got stuck on a slide and I'm like, okay, I, that's not the right slide. So I started to say previous slide, next slide, previous slide, next slide. And, you know, meanwhile, the marketers are cringing in the back and, you know, saying, Parker, just keep moving forward. So um, it was about, it's all about practice. It's not, you know, and I'm nervous every single time. Uh, but you know, I've learned to get up there and, and I do enjoy it once I get going. Um, but if you look at all the Salesforce events, you know, it's not just me. There are just so many amazing speakers and, you know, marketing for us is part of what's really important to show the future to our customers, to show the future to our partners, to show the future, frankly, to our employees. So when they're writing their software, they know where we want to go. And so we're painting that vision. And so marketing ever since we started the company has been key to our success. I love it. I've even hired like sketch artists to sketch like what the next stage of our company will look like and pass it around the office and stuff. Nice. Because, because when someone can see it, they can get there. 
it's really hard to get there when you like you can describe it with great words and everything but when you can see it what it should look like you you can then take action towards that destination totally agree yeah yeah i get nervous too i i just rewired it i told myself um or i heard this somewhere uh nervousness is just excitement because you're about to change the world that's usually what i say to myself before i go on stage I like that. well yeah. and also just knowing that everyone's nervous everyone's that's nervous normal yeah. And, and frankly, and back to the customer success note, reminding yourself that the people, at least for us at our events, uh, are excited to see you. They love you, you know, and, uh, and so they, they embrace you as you get up there and just reminding yourself that you're not in, you know, in a tough crowd. Yeah, the crowd is typically very supportive, at least yeah. in my experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, if you're Except sharing, you have value. to understand culture, though. You know, if you go to Japan and you present, you're not going to get the same reaction you get in the U.S. They'll be very straight faced, and you know, they will not be reacting to what you're saying um, uh, as directly. So, you, you just have to understand that and, and make sure you don't get surprised. Okay, <laughs> I'll make a note when I go to Japan. I should not expect the same people making posters with my name on it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They're not going to be clapping and jumping up and down uh, enthusiastically quite as much. <laughs> they will be inside, though. They will be inside. It's just a more reserved culture. I can hope. <laughs> Parker, you're the best, man. I, I can't say thank you enough. I'm so grateful that you took some time to come hang out, share yeah. some of your advice and your experience with the audience. It's, it's just really fantastic. I really enjoyed it, Joel. This was super fun. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for watching this interview. I hope it brought you a ton of value. If you liked it, give us a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and leave your thoughts in the comments below. Tune in to the Modern CTO channel weekly for more amazing videos just like this one.